Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlav, the host of Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to PDX. PDX is, of course, the airport code for Portland, Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon's international airport, by the way. PDX is also one of the many nicknames for Portland, Oregon. I, I've discovered traveling back and forth that Portland has a bunch of nicknames. Uh, maybe so it won't be confused with another Portland, but in any event, today my guest is Chris Hellman. Chris is a partner in the Portland, Oregon office of the law firm of Miller, Nash, Graham and Dunn, LLP. Miller Nash has offices in Portland, Seattle, Vancouver and Long Beach. Chris primarily practices international law and I've asked her to talk about her life and the law in Portland, Oregon. It's a city that I really enjoy going to, being in for many years, gone back and forth, and haven't heard much about it uh, personally. And I'd like to learn what's what it's like. First, though, Chris, welcome. It's it's good to see you. Thanks, uh, Mark. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit about yourself. How did you get into international law? What kind of cases do you handle? And w w do you enjoy it? Is is it what you want to do in law? So well, go for first, it. I'd like to say that I'm a little chagrined that you sent a surprise that Portland had an international airport. <laughs> My goodness, we're bigger than that. <laughs> well, I suspect a lot of people might not put that together. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, it does because it kind of, it, it's a little bit, um, it, it tells you more about Portland just from that fact alone. You know, it's surprising. Um, I deal with a lot of people all around the globe and I travel a lot in my practice and I'm always surprised at the number of people that know Portland, Oregon. So that's good. Well, to tell you a little bit about myself, I was actually born in Portland. I grew up mostly in Seattle. I went to law school here in Portland uh, to start and then I uh, did some additional law school in New York. Um, International law and my practice, I love my practice. That's why I've been in practice for over 45 years and that's why I'm still here is because I really, really like it. I didn't start this kind of practice until about 25 years into my practice. I did mostly um, business litigation work, I guess I'd say, some kinds of business contracts and a lot of business disputes. And then I was getting a little bored. And I thought uh, I need to do something else. And maritime law had been one of my specialties for a long time. And a lot of those cases were international. And I, I love to travel and I love to meet other people from other countries essentially. So I thought international law sounds like a good thing to do. So I went back to Columbia, as I said, after 25 years of practice and uh, got a master's in LLM and international law at Columbia. And I had a lot of fun. I hadn't planned on working quite so hard on my law masters. I was also interested in the decorative arts, but I didn't have much time for that. Um, but then when I came back, uh, the rest of my practice has been pretty much in international law and it's been a lot of fun. And, and you said a couple of things here that raised some questions. You say a lot of people that you, when you travel around the world, they know about Portland, Oregon. What do they know about it? And I mean, is, it, is, it a, is Portland, Oregon a place that attracts uh, foreign clients, uh, is, that, is that what they know about it? I mean, I, I really like Portland, Oregon just because of the atmosphere and the people. And it's just, I, I think, uh, you know, to me, it's like a, a place, at least in my background of the sixties where I, I really enjoy the, just the, what happens on the street and the people. I think that's mostly why people like it as well. Um, we don't have as much foreign business here as we do in larger cities like San Francisco or New York or Chicago or Miami or, or even Seattle has more than Portland does. So people seem to kind of know it as a quirky city and for one reason or another, they've heard of it. Um, there's a lot of interesting and odd things that have happened in Portland over the years since I've been here and people seem to know those. They come here for a vacation a lot. And uh, if somebody sees Vancouver, BC or maybe goes to Seattle, they oftentimes will come to Portland as well. And it's just so odd how many people have got, oh, I know my third cousin lives in Portland or you know, a friend of a friend lives in Portland. A lot of people seem to know about it. And it, it is a really interesting place to live. I haven't lived someplace else for very long, um, but I've always really liked living here. 
And and is it a, I mean, if I'm a foreigner, if I'm a foreign client, am I, is, is Portland receptive? Is it a, a place that I'd like to do business or how, how does? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I was thinking, well, what, you know, what might make Portland different than other places for doing business? And I think that a place is good for doing business for a lot of domestic or local reasons. And you just kind of add on top of that, the international. And the most important thing I think would be whether you do feel comfortable here as a foreigner coming to Portland. Portland's very eclectic. Um, it has a lot of people from a lot of different countries. Somebody asked, well, what's the biggest, what's the biggest foreign community in Portland? I'd have trouble telling you because there's somebody from everywhere here. Um, and, and people think of it as a liberal or progressive city. Um, most of Oregon, certainly in the, in the cities, is a democratic. In the East, it's more Republican. Um, but I would certainly say that Portland is, is thought of as a very progressive city. And most of the time, we think of our relationships with foreign countries as being progressive. And, and you know, and you, you said you liked traveling. What, what, what is that about? I mean, is that and, that, and that's what led you to the international law practice? Is that what gave you the, the, the inspiration to get into international law was the, the travel and meeting other people in different countries? What, what's that about it? It sounds like I just like to have a lot of fun and I'm not really very serious, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not true. Um, I guess I, I liked it for two reasons. Number one, um, it is really challenging. I mean, to know something about the law of most every country and then to know something about how the laws of other countries interact with our own law, that's pretty complicated. And so that was really interesting to me. And then I've just always liked other cultures because people in other cultures have a different perspective on us or on most, most things. And I think that the better people are the ones that have broader perspectives. Um, we're not always right. We can learn things from other countries. And that's always been interesting to me. I like that. I like that perspective. I feel the same way. I think that travel and getting out there is very helpful. And, and, and you, you, you grew up in Portland, but you, you, is, is there anything else that in, in enhanced that desire to travel in, in your personal background or was I don't really know what it was because I, I didn't, uh, well, I could tell a story on my mother here. I can remember I wanted to go overseas when I was in high school and my mother said, well, I haven't been overseas. What makes you think you can go overseas? <laughs> so maybe that was it. But uh, I didn't go to, uh, I didn't go overseas until I was practicing law. I never went into any other countries other than, well, I guess I never went into any countries other than Canada um, when I was growing up or when I was in high school, uh, undergraduate school or law school. But as soon as I did, I, I just really liked it. And I think it was exciting. You know, I mean, my, um, my husband doesn't like to travel very much. And the reason he doesn't like to travel is that he says, well, I, you know, I can't speak foreign languages very well. And I'm very uncomfortable not being able to speak English with people. And to me, I almost like it better because it's just always challenging. There's always a lot of stimulus because you have to figure out how to talk to people. And there's a lot of different ways to talk to people other than just speaking the language. And so I, I think I like that sort of personal challenge. And, and learning to communicate is very important with foreigners and learning to, I guess, tell them how to do business and how to practice, how to do law, legal things in the United States is being able to communicate is very important. Now, what, what have, you know, I, I've seen from your website that you've had clients in Japan, China, India, and I, I don't know, probably other locations also, but what, what are they telling you about the current events? I mean, we're going through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic here and uh, I mean, I'm sure Portland has been having to deal with it. What, what, are your, what are your foreign clients telling you about dealing with it and doing business in the United States nowadays? Well, I think I know a lot of both foreign clients and a lot of foreign lawyers because a lot of the work that I'm sent is sent from foreign lawyer contacts that I know, or else I'm sending them something in, in their country. I do a lot of work in, in Europe as well and some in South America and Latin America. Wow. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, 
Well, unfortunately, I think that um, a lot of people in foreign countries have lost some respect for the United States. I think that um, we have been seen as a leader for a long time and people are sad to see us no longer be a leader. Um, and that's, that's unfortunate. So that's not a good development, I don't think. Um, I still remember oh, many years ago meeting a German lawyer and having him say to me, thank you so much for the Marshall Plan. You rebuilt Germany after uh, the war and we'll always appreciate that. And I feel like we've lost a little bit of that goodwill. And I think he even told me at the time, you know, you've lost a little bit of that goodwill. And that was say 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that people, uh, I haven't talked too, too much to people about the politics here in the last couple of weeks, other than to see people just kind of shake their heads and say, what, what's going on? Have you guys all gone crazy? As far as the, as far as the pandemic, um, one good thing is I think that everybody cares about each other. And I know whenever I start off an email with a foreign lawyer or a foreign client, I always say, how is the pandemic affecting you and your country? I, I read the Times, so I have some idea of what it's like in different countries. And I'll say, I hear it's like this. Is that the case? And I hope you and your family are well. And people treat me the same way. So I think that they, I think most people in the world are concerned about all of the other people because they, they know how, you know, how awful it's been for people. You know, that's really interesting how the pandemic, what you're saying is that the, the pandemic has actually done something good in a way. I mean, it's, I gotta be careful how I say that, but it actually has made you, made you and everybody else more aware of each other and more concerned, you know? Well, it's interesting. I think that, uh, and this is a difference sort of between the US and, and foreign countries, in that you'll never get an email from somebody in Europe that doesn't start out with, how are you and your family? Uh, which is not something that we do in the United States. I do it with uh, people in foreign countries because I know they do, and I think it's I think it's appropriate. But usually we just get right down to business. And uh, a lot of the Asian countries are, let's just get right down to business. Um, but I usually start out with the European way because I think it's the best. So oh, that is a benefit maybe that we could all learn from. In, I, in the I agree with you. Or, or life. <laughs> I think one thing that, um, that I feel about the pandemic is that uh, people need to learn to be kind to one another. Because if you can't be kind to one another, we're all kind of in trouble. And I, I, I've seen a lot of instances where people have done that. And I think that's great. And, and I noticed that you uh, were a lecturer in China at a university, or is that correct? At one time? I was, and it's funny, I was thinking, now, Mark, you're not asking me very many questions about the law, <laughs> which is fine. So, what, what was that about? And, well, and... I, um, I was always interested in China, and uh, our law firm hired a uh, young Chinese lawyer, and this was back in the early 90s. So China had essentially just had opened up and had, was now graduating professionals from college again. And uh, she came here and she was working for our law firm. She had gone to law school in the United States after having gone to law school in China. And uh, so we hired her and she was a very interesting person. And um, she said, oh, I, I wish you would come to China and teach. And I said, well, I, I can't really get off work that long, um, but, uh, but I'd love to come to China. And is there any way I could teach on, uh, you know, for like a two week or three week basis? Oh, I, I can arrange anything you want. Um, she had a very good relationship with her university, which was Shaman University in Southern China. So my husband and I both went and we were there for, I think we were two weeks in Shaman teaching. And then we, uh, di then we did a little bit of traveling in China as well. And the interesting thing that came out of that is that um, we met a, a young woman who, uh, wanted to keep in touch with us after we left. And uh, this, this is maybe a fault of mine, um, but I'm always wanting to see more of people. And I said, oh, well, you should come and go to law school in the United States. We'll help you with that. <laughs> I'm sure my husband was rolling his eyes at the time, but uh, so she did. And we figured that she would, uh, you know, I mean, here, here we are, we were in our, what were we, in our forties at the time. 
And uh, my husband thought, well, she won't stay very long. You know, she'll come here, she'll make friends, and then she'll be out living in an apartment or someplace else. No, she lived with us for four years. And that was not really what I had in mind when I invited her, but she was a lovely person and she's just like a, she's just like a daughter to us now. Uh, she's great. She named her son after our son. And uh, she married, she's a lawyer practicing in China and she married a lawyer practicing in China. And I've done a lot of work with both of them. And uh, I just saw them, um, let's see, it was in November of 2019. So I saw her just a couple of months in China, just a couple of months before the pandemic started. I'm so glad I got there. Thanks. I don't know when we'll be able to get into places like that in the future. Well, okay. Let me ask you a, a question about law. You did a presentation on force majeure provisions in international contracts. And I'm wondering, what was that about? And does that have to do and it have anything to do with the pandemic? It was all to do with the pandemic. <laughs> um, a force majeure clause is a clause where, what, in a contract, and I think every contract has one, and if it didn't, it's part of the law, even without it, where it says certain kinds of events you get out of having to perform your contract. They're often called you know, acts of God or the like, but uh, war, insurrection, riots, uh, there's all sorts of different things where it's thought to be beyond the control of the person that is the party to the contract. So they shouldn't be forced to be penalized for not being able to deliver goods, for example, because there was a war going on in their country. Well, pandemic is one of the things that can qualify as a force majeure. There haven't been a lot of pandemics in our lifetimes. Certainly it's not true pandemics that take the whole world in, um, but there was this time. And so there were a lot of people that were facing this legal situation where what do you do when uh, I can't perform my contract as a result of the pandemic? So there've been a lot of force majeure cases, which there, there haven't been for years. They're just, that doesn't come up very often. So that, was, that was, was very interesting. And I've had a lot of cases that involve that. Oh, wow. So, and, and how do you uh, advise your clients? I mean, going forward, I mean, I guess they have to be more aware. I mean, before the pandemic, did we ever think there was going to be a pandemic? I guess the answer to me is I no. Think, I don't think we did. Um, well, what I what I learned was that um, well, I, I already knew that people tend to oftentimes put together form contracts themselves. Businesses do, and a lot of the times, you know, it works just fine. They get them off the internet. They they don't have familiarity with the provisions, but they put them together, and it seems to work. When you get into a crisis like this, that's when you start to look seriously at those individual provisions. And I was really surprised to see how different they were from contract to contract. So what happens as a result of a force majeure really depends a lot on the words of your contracts. And I, I've talked to a lot of clients who have wanted their contracts reviewed and their force majeure provisions revised because now they see that that's really an important provision. We just hadn't run into it before. And, and so what, I mean, are, are you now doing a new clause? Is that what's coming up? Is, is there a new force majeure clause? Or are you making sure that there's one in? How are you dealing with it? How are you addressing it? Almost all contracts have a force majeure clause. And as I said, if they didn't have it, there's, there's law that would essentially provide you with the same benefits as a force majeure clause would. But a force majeure clause can be broader or it can be narrower than what the law would give you. And the law is different from country to country. Whereas if you make a contract, then you know what the law is. It's right there in the contract. So I think I'd say that, I, that I've that um, i had to clean up a lot of force majeure provisions that weren't as good as they could have been. Maybe somebody uh, took half of one or, <laughs> or never really thought about how a particular clause fit with their own business. I guess that's the biggest issue is that they pick a clause that works for a different business and different kinds of situations, and they need one that actually works with their business. And, and do you now specifically refer to pandemics or is there, is yes. that yes. more? Yeah, I see. So yes. that's what you more include. And, and that's what you do for any contract, not just cross-border or international contracts, but I guess domestic that's contracts. That's yeah. true. And I think that um, most of the time people would think that a force, that a pandemic would be a force majeure. 
putting right. the actual word pandemic in there is helpful, but it's really a lot more than that because the force majeure clause will say what happens if there's uh, a crisis like that that's beyond your control. Uh, sometimes the clause will say, well, you have 90 days and if it doesn't stop within 90 days, the contract terminates. Or maybe it doesn't say that. Um, so there's there's sort of the consequences are the things that are different from contract to contract. I see. So get a little more specific. Uh, let me ask you now, how is your law firm dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic internally? And are you are you working from home? Is that basically what happens? Here I sit at home. Here I sit at home. You can probably tell by the mess on the desk behind the screen. Um, we're all working from home and we have been since the middle of March. Really? And uh, I, I'm with a very large firm. So there's probably 100 and, I don't know, 175 lawyers in all those different cities. And uh, I can remember the day that we left the office um, to go work remotely. And our managing partner said, okay, we're gonna do this for two weeks. And I'm very hopeful it will only be a week. <laughs> And I remember thinking, well, you know, is the world going to collapse? Is our business going to collapse? What's going to happen? We've never had all these people working from home before. And I was shocked to see, and this is true with most law firms, uh, shocked to see that everybody did work very well from home. We already had sort of home offices set up. Um, I've got a couple screens sitting here in front of me. And uh, and I frequently work from home in the sense that I would work in the evenings or because I travel, I always carry a laptop and I always work from my laptop in different countries. So I'm used to it. A lot of people aren't. Um, I was a little concerned that our it would be difficult for our assistants because they don't always have the same kind of computer technology set up in their homes as, as the lawyers do in, in theirs. But um, our, our firm made sure that everybody had very good equipment not only just computers, but chairs, desks, you name it. And uh, it's worked remarkably well. We've all, been, we've all been surprised. And none of us are going back to the office 100%. Nobody wants to go. Uh, everybody wants to go in and see people and we wanna go in and have social functions and we wanna have meetings as a partnership, business meetings, but we wanna be able to have the flexibility of working from home. And I, I think that I, I feel sorry for our landlord because I'm sure we're not gonna renew our uh, many square feet the next time because we just are not gonna need it all. And I guess you mentioned travel, but you're not traveling, right? You're, you're no, staying. I haven't yeah. even been to the outskirts of Portland. <laughs> and and you, you, you're, you're, all your meetings are virtual with your clients to your international clients, is that they right? Are. And you know, actually we conduct trials and arbitrations virtually as well. I just did a, a, uh, an international arbitration with a uh, company in China that, um, and another one in India that, um, were, that were done virtually. What, what kind of topics are those arbitrations about? You know, without going into anything that's confidential, but just generally, what, what kind of, what things are being arbitrated virtually? Nowadays. Well, the same sort of things that would be arbitrated in person. Um, okay. they're, all, they're all business transactions. And uh, so far, the ones have all involved pre-pandemic situations. It's taken that long to get to arbitration or to get to trial. But uh, at first, people were, you know, oh, let's put this off. We want to be able to do this in person. So we'll put this off a couple of months. Well, after a few months, you realize that you don't know when you're going to be back. And you can't wait to solve your business dispute that long. So you start to do it remotely. And I was I was also pleasantly surprised at how well at how well that went. Um, it went very well. Now, and and let me I kind of want to go back a little bit to talk about Portland. How are you? Is Portland dealing with the pandemic and the state of Oregon? How how are things just generally going on there? Is is uh, I mean we're we go up and down here in Hawaii, and I'm not not hundred percent sure when we'll open up again. Uh, how, how is this generally for, for Portland? You're, you're still doing business, but it's all virtual. But when, when do you think it's, things are going to open up? Well, it's, it's changed a lot from time to time over the course of the pandemic. Um, things pretty much shut down very quickly in the beginning, and then they eased up over the summer. I, I would go into restaurants and eat um, inside. And uh, now you can't eat inside in restaurants. Of course, when you could, things were all distanced and uh, 
everybody took a lot of precautions, but you could literally go in and sit down and have dinner. Now you can only eat outside. And, and if you know Portland, you know that it rains all the time. So we all wondered, what are we gonna do in the winter? How are restaurants gonna survive? And how are those of us that wanna get out of our house going to survive? Portland did a very interesting thing um, where we have parking on both sides of the streets now. The parking has been gotten away with in the business sections. And uh, they're all, the restaurants have all been allowed to basically open up and open up into the street and uh, put um, sort of temporary structures over that so that you get, you get a good airflow, but you have, um, you, know, you have a roof over you and you have some sides so that you don't get wet while you're sitting out there eating. But people do that a lot in Europe. Uh, people mm. eat and drink outdoors in Europe in bad weather with a, uh, you know, an awning over them and it's much more common. And now we've started to do it here too. And so is that, it's, it kind of sounds like a Portland idea. Is that uh, I don't coming? Know, I don't know whether it is or not, um, okay. but it certainly works well in Portland, I'll tell you that. Okay, now I wanna ask you just kind of to sum up your experience as an international lawyer doing international practice. What type of things have you learned about life and the practice of law from your international practice? Well, you know, I feel like I learned a lot about life and the practice of law from everything. I, um, my husband is currently in a facility, an assisted living facility, um, because he's not well. And we recently, Sorry. there are friends that we have that live there. They became friends after he moved into the facility. And uh, the male of that couple died this last week. And I was talking to his wife, who's uh, almost 20 years older than I am. And I was so impressed with her strength that I thought, here I am at my age and there are still things that I can learn. And I, it's the same way with, with law. I mean, you learn things about people in every instance if you're paying attention. Well, wow, that's... More than more than you wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, it's it's good. I I really appreciate that, and uh, I I sorry for what's happened. I appreciate you telling us about it. That's very important to to listeners to hear these type of things. What are your hopes for the future? What are where what are you thinking about with respect to international relations and just the world? Where what are your hopes? We have about a minute left. I can't wait for my first trip. I'll tell you that. It'll be difficult to figure out where I ought to go. Um, I hope that people will be more tolerant of each other if you wanna know what I think generally. And uh, I'm really eager to get out and talk in person to people because even though remote is works, um, you get a lot more out of things when you can do it in person. So I, I miss that. And I'm looking forward to being able to go to foreign countries and actually see people. Well, Chris, uh, Chris Helmer, I appreciate your knowledge and your advice and your thoughts about your personal life and your professional life all together. So uh, I thank you very much for being my guest today and uh, a guest from PDX. Uh, <laughs> well, I've been and, delighted, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. As we say here in uh, Hawaii, uh, Mahalo. Aloha. <laughs>